Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another ICPS talk with the International Carnivorous Plant Society. Today, we'll be talking about Drosera capensis in the wild, presented by myself, Andre Barnard. So quick about me, very, very quickly, I live in South Africa. I'm studying biodiversity and ecology at the University of Salamosh, and I have a massive interest in carnivorous plants, especially Drosera. If you'd like to check out more of my work, you can visit my website at capecarnivores.ca.za where I post all my photos of things in situ. So if you want to grow South African plants and see how they look in the wild, you have a look at them there. So I've been traveling extensively in the past year and a half or so to visit carnivorous plants in the wild, especially with people like Alex Dietrich, who does some absolutely fantastic work. In that time, I discovered two new species. On the left, we have Drosera sister flora, SVHB, my initials, it's a very small, dainty, sister flora complex plant with beautiful large flowers, about four centimeters in diameter. And the other one is something in the Drosera Afra complex. I found a way out in the middle of a sort of dry desert Karoo area and a perennial stream, very unusual, and hopefully we'll have descriptions for those in the coming years. So what is Drosera capensis? It's a large perennial carnivorous plant, often getting to 15 to 20 centimeters tall, equally as wide, and it's extremely popular worldwide. It's easy to grow, it's beautiful, it's big, it flowers readily, it's super easy to look after, but what really happens with them in the wild? So first you've got to have a quick look at the distribution. It's found across quite a lot of the Cape, especially on the peninsula, down by Cape Town. It's found all the way through the Cedarburg up until Friedendal. Gifberg is there right at the top, that's at where the iconic Gifberg reds are from. There's a few along the coastal mountains in Hanmanus and Hanspai, and some inland in Swanendam, Oetshoorn, and stretching out to Jeffreys Bay in Kibarga, formerly Port Elizabeth. So in the wild, they flower quite readily as well. That one there has four inflorescences. They usually flower in summer, in the summer months, so you'd and often see them October to February or so, but they flower just about through the year really if conditions are ideal. I've got some outside that are flowering now as we're going into winter, where they've flowered most prolifically in summer. They have beautiful pink little flowers, often about 10 to 15 on a stem, and some plants like that one there can have four inflorescences going at once. In the wild, they're pollinated by monkey beetles, and chrysomelid beetles as well. They're related to ladybirds. It's about a bit of a mouthful, but they often self-pollinate very readily. Outcrossing is obviously preferred, but if an insect can visit them, that's all good. They don't really offer any pollen, so they're often visited by beetles and insects that live or eat petals. So petal-eating insects, or the pollen-eating insects, or those that think there might be some nectar, but are unfortunately tricked. This is something used a lot by the sister flora complex as well, with a dark center flower to resemble other dark-centered nectar-offering flowers in the environment. These photos were provided by Alex Dietrich. They're absolutely wonderful. Definitely go check out his work. So to get more into the details of Capensis, what are the general habitat needs in the wild? They're very common in cultivation, but in the wild it's actually less so. They're fairly specific about the conditions they inhabit. So despite their widespread distribution, they're often very narrowly localized to areas with a lot of water and a lot of sunlight. So you can see here that they'll live in a variety of habitats so long as there's water. There's some living in a rock, pretty much just by a stream. Moss walls are quite often used, or peat banks, and even sandy areas provided there's enough water. But moss and peat is definitely their preferred substrate. So typical habitats you can find them in are, are the feinbos. That's where the majority of their distribution lies. That plant there you can see is in a stream in the feinbos biome. So feinbos is a habitat or vegetation type endemic to the Cape of South Africa, characterized by the presence of proteas, ericas, geophytes, and restio plants. Usually having any three of those will categorize something as feinbos, or is it all four? I cannot remember off the top of my head. But feinbos has many streams, seasonal seepages, lots of kluifs, um, which are large ravines, sometimes wooded, sometimes not often with permanent water, which Capensis really enjoy. So you'll often find them on ledges or in kloofs. The ones on the left are quite hazardous to get to, often with about five meter drops. So they're growing in small moss banks on the edges of these rocks where there's permanently running water year round. Or there is a risk of them getting run 
run away by seasonal flooding. As you can see on the right, these compensas are regrowing after the majority of the adult plant material was washed away. But sometimes if the roots remain intact, they can regrow. They're often found quite often in the Cedarberg to the north of the Fainbos. So Fainbos stretches into the Cedarberg and then it starts going into more succulent areas. It's more arid up there. So you'll often find them by rivers, such as the one on Chufbach on the left, with all those drosser living in little pans in the slow moving areas of this water. They also quite often inhabit low-lying habitats, such as these ones in Royal, South Africa. So these are only at about an elevation of 200 meters. So they're not particularly montane specific, but they, there's permanent water there. There's a stream, it's a lovely red Fainbos water. It's pretty typical of the area from all the aluminium and tannins that run out. Fainbos as a whole is quite poor and peaty in the soils. So there's a lot of tannins that run off into the streams. It tastes delicious though. So there's many, many banks of capensis along these streams. Often, especially in flatter areas, capensis will get flooded. The ones on the left lived a little like in Khonsvai and they got flooded and eventually they start petering out and they die back to the roots until the water recedes. As you can see on the right, sometimes they'll send out a quick little death bloom, you know, just to try and get their seeds out before the adult plant eventually drowns underwater. They are very good at recovery though. The plant on the left is at that aforementioned lake site where the water had receded enough for the plant to regrow. And the one on the right was on Chufbach and had a very funny little crestate mutation. I grow a few of these and I saw after stress, so I'll come up with all these funny leaves. That one has at least six heads. You can also see some Utricula robusquamata in the foreground, something Capensis grows with quite often. You can also see the flower or seed heads in the back. So capensis are quite easy to cultivate. They're very popular for a reason, being so easy, so forgiving. There's really no one right way to grow them. I think the only thing is they like a lot of water. For soils, they're quite easy. On the left, I have some in sphagnum moss. It's very popular for carnivorous plants. It's light, keeps water while they often grow in it in the wild. But on the right, I've also got a mix of 50% fairly fine silica sand and 50% peat, and they're actually quite happy in it. Um, they grow very well, if not better than the ones in the sphagnum. It's hard, it's hard to say really, but I think any moist retaining media without any organic composts and nitrogen materials, they hate nitrogen. So compost and potting soil is generally not ideal. You have to base it off of something like peat to make sure that it's acidic, there's no nutrients that can burn the roots. Sphagnum is ideal because it's acidic and it contains very little nutrients generally. Just make sure to avoid peats that have added fertilizers or that sort of thing that's generally very bad. There's a lot of information available for this online as well, thankfully. So for lighting, you have many, many options. I grow a lot of mine indoors under strong LED lighting. Back in the day, people use fluorescence, but those are generally discontinued now due to the heat they produce due to the immense amount of power they consume. So I have mine there, my tray, 60 by 60 centimeters, under about 54 watts of LED lighting, but I also grow a lot of mine outside. You tend to get better color that way, a lot more flowering, seasonal fluctuations, and they can grow year round pretty much anywhere where they get some direct sunlight for a few hours a day, but try to avoid frost if possible. They're generally not a fan. I don't get it here in South Africa, but overseas it might be ideal to bring them indoors when frost is predicted. Propagation of Drosera capensis is also super, super easy. They're very vigorous from leaf cuttings, as shown here on the left. I pluck a leaf off, gathering about as much of it as I can, and a healthy leaf as well. A sickly leaf will often rot before any plantlets come out. And I stick it directly on some wet peat. People also float them in water, which works quite well, but I find the resulting sprouts are often quite leggy and it takes a bit longer for them to adapt. So I stick them on some flat on some peat in a sealed container under my lights. After a few weeks, you'll get sproutlets, so ones on the left are not capensis, but very similar, so a little... A plant will grow out of the leaf, essentially, and then once they're rooted, you can plant them out. The photo on the right, you can see some capensis in the rotten remainders of the initial leaf, where the plantlets manage to sprout out and continue growing. And you can do this super easily. Just You can grow them in water, on sphagnum, on peat. I, I prefer peat. That's what I've seen to have the best results so far. 
Seeds are also stupendously easy. You can sow them on any of the substrates. Some people even float them in water or put them on a wet paper towel. Generally, a humid environment helps grow them as quickly as possible. They're often hitchhike, as you can see them here in this part of Drosera and Atlantis. I've just got a random Capensis that has come up from somewhere. So if they seed and you leave them be, they'll generally end up all over your collection um, in no time, but they're quite easy to pick out looking so different from other plants. So after brushing over the sort of conditions in the wild, let's go over some of the really famous and other locations that you see them. So Bainscroft is probably one of the most common well-kept capensis. There's a very nice white leaf strain from there and also stem forming. So this is some capensis I found at a Drosta rubrifolia site. The one on the bottom is a sort of wider leaf compact form and the one while well, it was a bit higher up the slope was very stemmy. They might also be the same form as stemmy one is just much older. So you can see there's lots of old leaves so they grow higher and higher over time forming a bit of a woody stem as well. The plant old leaves drop off. I've also found some very nice ones at Solari's Pass. So he's on the edge of a logging road. There's a nice sphagnum bog sort of at the side. There are a few orchids, lots of Drosera admirabilis. But also Capensis, so it's a fairly seepy area, water runs across the path from higher up in the mountain. It gets fog very often, which is how I suspect it keeps it wet, being a bit more inland. And they even grow in the very sandy areas, as seen on the right. It's, Capensis will grow pretty much anywhere, so long as there's water and they don't get too hot. And as seen earlier, Roy Els, probably one of my favourite Capensis locations. A very, very large, robust form. I saw some plants that were over 30 centimetres in diameter, or about there. On the left, you can see them growing off just on the bank of a stream with a lot of Dysa tripetaloides. It's a commonly kept Dysa orchid from the Cape as well. And on the right, there's a bit of a sunnier spot full of... It's, they form these large, massive patches. I'm not sure either clonally, because they do sometimes reproduce through their roots, or their seeds don't disperse very far, and they make these large clumps. In Stanford, I found this poor little soul. He was another flood victim. So regrowing fairly small, there's a lot of utricularia around it. Um, I don't know how this one looks when it's bigger, unfortunately, but it's a testament to their tenacity. There were very few plants, but they were regrowing well, and I think after one or two seed seasons, there'll be plenty all over the place again. Franchuk also had some very nice capensis. The one on the left was in a sort of sphagnum runoff bog again running downhill, there are lots of capensis in the sunny spots, there's sort of little clearings in the feinbos. And the one on the right was on a drip wall. So when they were making this pass, they took a lot of dynamite and they cut a path essentially into the mountain sides to get between the between the towns. So I think it's between Franchuk and Selamash. So and on these walls there's a lot of water that usually would have run down the hill, but it was cut off making a sort of wet wall with lots of mosses, lots of other plants. There's a lot of sundews on that as well. It's Drosera elysiae, there's a scopensis, and they just inhabit it like nothing else happened. Um, Drosera are often very good pioneer species. They're quite easy to find while hiking because they just sort of grip to the path side um, where it's nice and open. There's very little competition to them. Then in Stellenbosch, one of my first scopensis spots, this was in the mountains here, down a cliff. I found a few sundews at the top. And my friend wanted to find some frogs that was pictured there. So we cl clambered on down. It's very slippery, very wet. And these capensis were mostly just living in little pockets of organic material collected by plants that had lived there and decayed or stuff that had flushed downhill. So growing out of these rocks is very nice and wet and also very sunny. Um, and it was flanked by large cliffs where we found this Cape Ghost Frog. This is Heliophryne Purcelli, I believe. Very... Well, it's fairly widespread, but locally rare. You really have to dip into cracks and crevices to look for them. So for the herpetologists out there, it's a nice little glimpse into rare Cape fauna. And of course, the iconic Gufberg, or Gufberg, or Gufberg, or however people pronounce it overseas. This has an amazing diversity of Drosera, everything from Drosera alba to Drosera capensis. There's several new species up there. There's very nice utricularia, like utricularia brachycerus, nice white utricularia biscomata, another common cultivation weed. But the capensis up there are also quite interesting. The one on the left was found in the middle of a river on Gufberg, 
and the ones on the right are also just on that river but further down sitting in very slow moving relaxed sections and of course you can do it without the the famous Chafberg ledge so any Chafberg red capensis and cultivation almost definitely came from this ledge on the side of the mountain also cut into a pass so there's a wet wall there where water runs down the moss all these capensis grow almost at a 90 degree angle off the wall and they look absolutely stunning they were huge very mature beautiful plants it's a pleasure to see them and last but not least we have the Groot Winterhoek area so this is quite a large mountain range um, at the lower end of the Cedarberg it gets very cold in winter but there's quite a few nice capensis there's one on the left was actually at a popular holiday resort just around swimming pools and then the one on the right was on a farm we went to to go visit or try to find a new species, another location of it. But there were also these nice capensis that had been washed away by a flood, but were rapidly growing back. I managed to grow one of these from cuttings and it's quite a lovely form. And yeah. So that is it for capensis in the wild in the Cape. I really hope you enjoyed this quick little talk, a quick little run through. Please do go check out my website at www.capecarnivores.co.za that's where I post all of my photos I'm also on Instagram at Cape Carnivores I neglected to mention that earlier so I hope you've come out of this a little bit wiser as to the world of Capensis and as always happy growing the International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants we welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists we started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.